1 through 3. I got a lot to get to today, so I'm not going to waste as much time or tell as many stories. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sure, sure. All right. Praise the Lord. For all who fear God and trust in him are blessed beyond expression. Yes, happy is the man who delights in doing his commands. His children shall be honored everywhere. For good men's sons have a special heritage. He himself shall be wealthy and his good deeds will never be forgotten. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for, for a time of rest uh, last week. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for my brother Bojo stepping up in such a great way. Um, Father, I just, I, it's awesome to watch my brother allow you to work through him. And I know that it touched a lot of people last week. And uh, Father, I just ask that you do the same for me today. Father, just work through me. Take myself out of the equation. Uh, Father, I just want people to see you today through this message. I want to thank you for the inspiration of this marriage and, uh, or excuse me, this, this message today. This, the inspiration that you gave me that, um, uh, that, that, that even though somebody's no longer here, um, their legacy will live on. And I, I praise you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, Father, I want to thank you for the visitors that are here today, friends and loved ones that have come today. Uh, it always means so much to receive confirmation that, that, Father, we're doing this right. And um, again, I praise you for that. Father, in this moment, you've given me a message to give, and this is your message, no doubt. And Father, I just need you to anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I need you to take all pride, selfishness, distraction, doubt, pride, Father, pride, I, just, I ask that you take all that away from me, Father. Just anything at all that would take me away from giving your word. Father, I ask that you cast it into the sea and you replace it with your love, your breath, your word, your discernment. Father, in your peace, I need people to get peace from this today. I ask these things in your name. Help us to love, laugh, and forgive. Amen. All right. Today we live in a world of societal chaos, and this is rooted from Christians who refuse to leave a spiritual legacy. It's our fault. It's the church's fault. We should be very concerned about this. And the reason why we need to be concerned is because Satan has been building his army while the army of God has been shrieking. Every Christian should want to leave a legacy behind when they leave this earth. That is biblical. I want to go to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. That verse tells me that to leave a strong Christian legacy we need to be looking not only to the first generation, not just to the second generation, but to the third generation of the future of our families. In other words, we need to be looking at the future and not our past to leave that strong Christian legacy. Today I want to discuss three men, two from the Old Testament that left two completely different legacies, and then one from what we call the Now Testament uh, that touched many lives right here in the Texarkana community. Today's title, A Warrior Legacy. The man that you see on the screen is Randy Powell. Randy passed away last week. Last week... Um, uh, uh, early morning of uh, February the 15th, I received a phone call from his brother 
telling me that he had passed away. Um, Randy had been battling COVID, pneumonia. Uh, I'd been to see him a few times, uh, him and his wife, Darlene. Me and Randy served together at another church and then have served together in God's church. He's an amazing man and he left a great example. <laughs> this past Sunday was his funeral. That's why we came home early last week. Some of y'all were like, what are you doing here? We came home to make sure that we could make it to his funeral. And when church was over, went home, and I was fixing to be on my way to Atlanta, where the funeral was. And God told me as I was walking out the door to grab my Bible. And immediately I'm, I'm, I'm asking him, I'm like, God, why do you want me to grab the Bible? I'm, I'm not the one officiating this funeral. Uh, you know, I kind of felt like, are, are you trying to tell me I'm supposed to say something? Or maybe when I get there, somebody's going to ask me to say something. Silence. He wouldn't tell me a thing. So I grabbed the Bible, which is the Bible that, my Bible I've had for 10 years, and put it in the car and I drive off. And on the way there, I'm still asking him why, why, why. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. When I pull up at the funeral, he asked me a question. He said, what is Randy Powell's favorite Bible verse? And the reason that I remember that is the first time I ever met Randy Powell and I shook his hand, I stuck my hand out, shook his hand, I said, I'm Micah. He said, well, I'll never forget that because my favorite Bible verse is Micah 6, 8. I immediately turned to Micah 6, 8 in my Bible. I know it's hard to read my chicken scratch. I don't even remember writing that. Randy Powell's favorite verse. I love how God comforts us in hard times. But my, my man, Randy Powell, now this is from the Holman. We're going to actually go study it in a different translation. But in the Holman translation, mankind, he has told you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. That was Randy Powell. Now, I really want to dive into this verse, this particular passage. But before we do, I need to give you a little bit of a background on the book of Micah and Micah, the author of this book. The biblical definition of Micah, who is godlike? I think my mom had that in mind when she named her son. She did. She did. So every time y'all look at me and y'all like, what is he doing? Just remember, I'm godlike. Okay. <laughs> there are also characteristics that come with this name. If you name somebody, Micah, there's certain characteristics. Nick, if you could pull that up. They're humble, they're kind, they're just, they're merciful, they're loving, and they're incredibly handsome. <laughs> I don't know why y'all laughing. Y'all stuck that in there. I mean, why are you laughing at it? <laughs> Michael was a great prophet. All right, let's get serious. Michael was a great prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, he is famously known for prophesying the birth of Jesus 700 years before it actually happened and also prophesying the location, which, of course, is Bethlehem. Uh, Micah did not agree. I love this about him. Now, I want y'all to think about this today. Micah did not agree with the governmental centers of powers in his nation. Uh, this led to his strong concern for the Jewish people and their future. Therefore, Micah directed such, or excuse me, Micah directed much of his prophecies towards the powerful Israelite leaders of Jerusalem at that time. Uh, in this particular passage, Micah is prophesying the judgment on the Israelites because they have turned against God. So, here in chapter 6, the people want to know what they can do to change this destructive legacy that Micah is prophesying on them. And then that's when God says, and we're going to pull it up in the NIV, Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? I want to break these down, but the thing is, it, this verse is pointing out three major characteristics that he expects of all of us. 
And if you can live by these three major characteristics, you will leave that legacy for your children's children's children. That third generation down. We're going to break these down. Again, three things. Pull that up for me, Nick. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. That's the three things that Jesus, excuse me, that God's telling us, that Micah says, that God speaks through him in Micah 6, 8, explaining that this is what it's going to take to turn around what y'all have already destroyed. So acting justly, we're going to talk about that first. To act justly means making fair decisions in our personal and professional lives to set an example of treating people with true dignity and love. Acting justly requires action and not mere talk. This was Randy Powell to a T. Again, we're talking about the Now Testament, so I'm going to speak on this, this, this disciple from the Now Testament. That he was such a strong family man. His children were raised right. One's in the medical field. The other one is in the military. I think he knocked that out of the park. And an amazing wife who honored him, loved him, respected him, like we talked about in our past series of warrior marriage. He was a good businessman. But he was a fierce friend and an amazing mentor to me. Acting justly, setting that example. I need a lot of y'all to get this, especially a lot of you older guys that are in here. If you can just act justly, you're setting an example that turns you into a mentor for a lot of us young men and young women. Again, Randy Powell knocked that out of the park. Then it's love mercy. Now, this one's hard, but I need you to understand something. It doesn't say show mercy. It doesn't say like mercy. It says that you love mercy. Now, a lot of us get this wrong. A lot of us think, well, yeah, I love mercy. When I do something wrong, I love mercy. No, 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 no. You love giving mercy. That's what this is talking about. We all love mercy. But do you love to give it? It's a struggle of mine. A friend, a family member, your spouse, your children, those are easy to give mercy to. They love you and you love them. But what about the person that did you wrong and doesn't love you? What about the person that doesn't deserve mercy? It's really hard, again, to just love to give mercy to somebody that doesn't even deserve it. But I need you to think about something. Aren't you glad that thought didn't cross Jesus' mind when he was dying on the cross for us? Isn't it great that he loves mercy? We're supposed to do our best to mimic Jesus Christ. Randy Powell showed mercy on a whole nother level on two occasions that I'll never forget. And I can't go into a lot of detail on them because some of it's private. But... There were two people at a church that we were involved in that made some major, major mistakes. Major mistakes. Mistakes that could cause a family to just fall apart. And Randy didn't agree with it, and he implemented church discipline on that. But I do know till the day he died, he still loved them, talked to them, and prayed for them. That's showing mercy to the person that just really doesn't deserve it. And trust me, they didn't deserve it. But that was that man's heart. Again, we need to do our best to walk in these areas that I know, again, I struggle with. And since we're talking about walking, now walk humbly. That's the last one. Humility holds the key to both acting justly and loving mercy. If you walk down the path of humility, the other two will follow. And I want to explain this to you. 
as we as Christians recognize how much mercy God has shown on us, humility empowers us to act justly towards others. Hey, I, Nick, if you could pull Micah 6 8 back up for me, please. Okay, require of you, Lord, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Okay, I need y'all to understand something, and I don't know why he did this. I don't think Micah was really that smart a guy. I think that God was really trying to tell him a different way of doing this. I'm going to explain why. Y'all are like, why would you talk about this great man of the Bible like that? He's got my name. He's my brother. It's okay. But love mercy, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. If you walk humbly, the other two come. That's what I just said. Why didn't he just say, walk humbly? Why didn't he just say that? If you walk humbly, the other two have to follow. It's like I said, if you walk down the path of humility, mercy and acting just, all that's got to be, it's on that path, right? So I think my boy Micah should have broke it. No, he was telling the same what God told him. For some reason, God said this, and I still can't figure it out to this day. I love this verse, and I've read it many, many times, but I don't understand why it wasn't just walk humbly. What I'm trying to get the point across to you guys is this. If you don't remember this Bible verse at all when you walk out of here today, just remember to walk humbly. Do you understand? Everything else will fall into place. Randy, one time at an elders meeting, we were elders at another church. Uh, <laughs> Randy came up with a great idea, really good idea. And uh, so we, we presented it to the church. And, 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 it, and, and it blew up, and it worked, and it was great, and everybody was so excited. And somebody came to Randy and said, man, that's a great idea y'all had. And he said, Micah came up with it. Made me look like a rock star. That was Randy Powell, the very humble man. Never took credit. For anything, and I truly mean that, that I know of, I never saw that man take credit of anything except for maybe his fashion, okay? Because <laughs> he did dress to a T. He was a strong man, guys, and, and again, I know a lot of y'all don't know him, but I wish you did. And I'll say this right now in front of all of you if it's not for Randy Powell, you're not sitting in those seats in this church right now. That man truly changed my life. And I, I thank him for it. Yeah. Without a doubt, heaven definitely gained an amazing angel. There's no doubt about that. An amazing warrior, put it to you that way. If there was a Christian Warrior Hall of Fame, he'd be in it. We need to put that together one day. That'd be pretty cool. You got a whole section for Mikey, you know. <laughs> That's right corner or something like that. <laughs> all right now that we've discussed this great disciple that i love so much uh, i want to discuss the two men from the old testament we're going to start with king david uh everybody knows who king david is right and he was an anointed man uh did a phenomenal job right you know kills goliath much courage uh and, and and he was doing great man like he was building the kingdom everything was great and 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 then this this girl named Bathsheba showed up Messed it all up, okay? And for those of y'all who don't know the story, he, he saw Bathsheba bathing, and, and, and he went to Bathsheba, and they, you know, things got out of control, and he had, her, had his husband killed. Um, and, and this started a domino effect, this affair. And then having her husband killed started a domino effect that affected generation after generation of King David's family. And that's where we're going to go into after this has happened, David's character influenced his children's character. Men, husbands, fathers, wives, your character will influence your children's character. I promise. These kids, they watched his lustful affairs, his pride, his selfishness, his lies, his cover-ups firsthand. Shortly after David's affair with Bathsheba, David, uh, David's oldest son, Amnon, raped his half-sister Tamar. Now, I'm fixing to go through. This is going to take me a minute, okay? Like, y'all be patient. And some of these names I'm probably going to get wrong. And if I do, don't tell me, okay? If, if you don't like it, you come up here and say them, okay? 
because it's hard to say some of these names. Okay, that, thank you. So, yeah, I mean, so I was thinking Bojo, but I'm not going to do that. So the oldest son, Amnon, raped his half-sister, Tamar. Because of this, Tamar's brother, Absalom, killed Amnon. Then Absalom came against David and tried to dethrone him because, and, and, and then at that point in time, David's nephew, Joab, killed Absalom. Are y'all following this? Total destruction, right? Like, you can't keep up with it. It's such a mess. You can't keep up with it, right? Okay, but I'm not done. So then after this, the, the legacy, this fallen legacy continued on uh, even after David's death. His son Solomon took over as king. During his reign, uh, he had relations with over 1,000 women. Crazy. 700 wives and then 300 concubines. That's girlfriends. I, I never understood. You already got 700 wives. Why not just have 300 more? I don't understand why he didn't just marry those 300. It didn't make any sense to me. David, uh, you know, didn't teach Solomon very well when it came to this. So 1,000 women, this is what Solomon ends up with. It was Solomon's lustful desires for some of those women that introduced idolatry to Israel. Some of those women did not believe in God. They believed in other gods. Therefore, that tempted Solomon to go down the same path. And it caused major destruction for Israel. After Solomon's death, King David's grandson, this is where I may get it wrong, Rehoboam, Boham, Boam, Boam, Rehoboam, Rehoboam, that's it, Rehoboam, takes the throne, uh, and things got even worse. We're going to go look at that. I want to look at 1 Kings chapter 14. We're going to read verses 22 through 24. During his reign, the people of Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, provoking his anger with their sin, for it was even worse than that of their ancestors. For they also built for themselves pagan shrines and set up sacred pillars, uh, as their poles, that's, uh, that, that's actually a, uh, that was a, a woman goddess is what, she, is what that was, on every high hill and under every green tree. There were even male and female shrine prostitutes throughout the land. The people imitated the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. So God worked so hard to get rid of all this before he brings the Israelites to this land. And then as you can see, they turned around and did the same dadgum thing. And then here's the bad part. After Rehoboam's death, King David's great-grandson, Abijam, Abijam, took the throne and I want y'all to see, <laughs> you would think this would put an end to all this tragedy and so forth, this legacy that was getting passed down by King David. But let's go look at 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 3 now. He committed the same sins as his father before him, and he was not faithful to the Lord his God. Okay, so King David's legacy. King David, great man makes a huge mistake, has an affair, kills the husband of the wife who he has an affair with, and a domino effect happens. His son does the same thing, his grandson does the same thing, and his great-grandson does the same thing, and actually the verse said even worse. One mistake this man made. Now, he made a lot of mistakes. We know that if you've read about King David, but this was the major mistake that started knocking all the dominoes down. Hold on to that. Now I want to go and discuss the second legacy uh, that, a, that a different man left in the Old Testament, which is Judah. Judah is the fourth son of Jacob. Okay, For those of y'all that know who Jacob is, if you don't know who Jacob is, it's okay. I'll get this story through and you'll, you'll understand what's going on. He was the fourth son of Jacob. He was really the leader of the brothers until Joseph was born. Joseph being the youngest son at that point in time of Jacob. Okay, so Setting this, set this up, what you've got, Joseph comes in, a lot of y'all know this story, coat of many colors, okay, that's Joseph, uh, Jacob was so excited to have this son, so he gives him this coat, he really favor. He, he had a lot of favoritism towards Joseph, uh, so Joseph, the brothers got jealous of him, Judah being the leader of these brothers, 
decided at some point in time that they had to get rid of this guy. Judah was actually the main one that was instigated to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelite traders. Okay. It's got to be pretty bad when it gets to a point where you want to sell your own brother as a slave. And that's what happened. There's 12 brothers. You got 11 other besides Joseph. And they're all against him. And Judah, being that leader, is the one that stepped up and said, hey, let's get rid of him. In fact, I think I got that. Yeah, Genesis 37, 26 through 27. Let's look at that. This is where Judah becomes the instigator. So Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. They listened to Judah. That shows that he is that leader. Okay? At this point, we see that Judah is a liar, a thief, a conniving person, a jealous person, and a person that is hungry for power. He is willing to do anything he can to better his position. But we're about to add something else to Judah's rap sheet. So not only is he a terrible brother, and he's a liar, and he's a thief, and so forth. Now, in Genesis chapter 38, Judah gets married. He has three sons. Uh, he arranged his first son to marry uh, a young lady named Tamar. Okay, um, Tamar, after she marries this son, this son is becomes evil, and uh, God takes him, is what it says. In other words, he dies, okay? So when that happened, so now the other son of Judah, the next one in line, has to marry Tamar, okay? That was the way it was back then. It was custom back then if the older brother passes away and the younger brother, he has to go and take his wife, okay? That was custom back in the day. So the younger brother comes in. Actually, it was a middle brother. There's three brothers, right? So the middle brother comes in. He marries Tamar. He's evil. He does something against God, and God gets rid of him. So now it's come down to the third son. And by this time, Judah's a little freaked out. He thinks Tamar got some issues, okay? He's not blaming this on his sons. He thinks this is Tamar, right? So he figures out a way to lie to her and say, hey, well, my youngest son, he's not quite old enough to get married. When he becomes of age, we'll come get you. You go back to where you come from, okay? So she does. But she finds out later on that the boy had reached age, and Judah still was keeping the boy from her. And that's where we're going to pick up. I want to pick up at Genesis 38, 15 through 16. Oh, actually, i got to tell you this part. So when she found out about it, she decides that she's going to dress like a prostitute to try and get Judah, to try and trick Judah, to get close to her so she can connive this family, right? Okay, so when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her and said, Come, let me sleep with you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So now, womanizer, adulterer, and honestly, a dirty old man has been added to Judah's scorecard. From the day he sold his brother Joseph, Judah had fallen out of God's favor. Okay, so here's where we're at. King David makes a mistake with Bathsheba, right? Remember all this. Calls a domino effect in the family, okay? Now Judah, as soon as he sells his brother to slavery, y'all can start to see these dominoes falling, right? Everything's falling out of place. His legacy is being tarnished. Are y'all following me at all here? All y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy right now. Like I need Christian head nods. Thank you. Okay. So this is where we're at. Something happens in Genesis chapter 44. 
Joseph is now second in command in Egypt. If most of y'all know this story, he's sold to slavery, ends up being Potiphar's uh, servant, and then, then he, Potiphar's wife ended up messing with him and said that he was trying to rape her and this, that, and the other, and he gets thrown back in jail, and then while he's there, he starts interpreting dreams, and when he starts interpreting dreams, then he gets to Pharaoh. Pharaoh comes to him with dreams. He interprets his dreams, tells him what God's trying to tell him. It all worked out. Now he's second in command. Okay, Joseph was awesome. I love Joseph. And patient through the whole process. I don't know that I could have done all that. If I remember correctly, Don, correct me, I think it was 16 years he had to spend doing all this mess. 16 years in jail, 16 years as a slave, so forth and so on, before he became second in command. Okay? So that's where we're at. Genesis chapter 44, verse 33 through 34. Now, at this point in time, there's a famine that hits Egypt. The brothers of Joseph, that they think he's dead, right? So, so the brothers come to Egypt to get wheat and to, to get materials because Joseph was smart enough to store those back during the famine. That was part of the dream that Pharaoh had, okay? So the brothers are coming to him for help, but they don't know it's him. They're coming to him. They see him, but they don't know it's him. You know, he's dressed up like an Egyptian. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't, they don't understand that that's actually him. And at that point in time, there was another younger brother that was after Joseph, and that was Benjamin. He's telling them that they're trying to steal from him. He's trying to tell them that y'all are spies. Because, again, they don't know who he is. And they said, the only way that I believe this is if you go get your father and bring him back to me, but you have to leave Benjamin here. Judah speaks. This is Judah. This is the one that's caused all the problems, right? He's like the main mastermind behind all this. So please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I couldn't bear to see the anguish this would cause my father. Three things happen right here. Judah has had a change of heart, and he becomes a Micah 6, 8 man. Put that back up there for me, Nick. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. Judah in this moment acts justly by doing what's right, takes the place of his brother. He loves mercy, okay, because he's showing mercy on his brother. Let me take this place, right? I'll take the place of this. And then walking humbly by stepping up and accepting that position. He knew that he made a mistake years ago that caused all this problem. So now he's willing to make it right this time. That's a heart change. Y'all follow me? There's one more part of Judah's story we have to look at at Genesis chapter 49. This is Jacob, his father, who is dying. And he has Joseph bring all the brothers in so he can explain the future plans God has in store for each of their legacies. In other words, God's already told Jacob what's going to happen to all these brothers, which, by the way, there's 12. And if this will set something for you guys, it is the 12 tribes of Israel that come from these 12 brothers. Okay? Let's look at Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10. He's speaking to Judah. This is Jacob dying on his deathbed, telling Judah what his legacy is going to be that God's given him. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Who dares to rouse him? Verse 10, the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. The one. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Now, I need you to get this. This is a man made a lot of mistakes, right? But he had a change of heart. And because of that, he's blessed with the one. In 1992, let me get a drink before I tell this story. 
It's the only story I got today, Bojo. In 1992, and it's not a story, it's history. In 1992, in the NFC Championship game in the NFL, So in 1992, <laughs> NFC Championship games in San Francisco, Dallas is playing the 49ers. Some of y'all will remember this name, Alvin Harper. Who remembers Alvin Harper? Raise your hands. That's, y'all are true Christians. I love y'all. <laughs> he was a wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys. Now, let me ask this. Who knows Michael Irvin? Raise your hand. Okay, yeah, a lot more of y'all, right? Michael Irvin was better. Okay, Alvin Harper was the number two. But throughout the game, it was, it was a tight game. It was a struggle, and I remember it. It had rained the night before. It was real muddy on the field. It was, it was a tough game. And Alvin Harper was having a bad game. He had dropped three or four passes that were thrown his way. I mean, hit him right in the numbers. He was number 80. I mean, I can hit him right between the eight and the zero. He dropped the pass. I could tell Troy Aikman was getting a little frustrated. Even as a kid, I could watch this, and I could see it. He was having a tough game. But Troy Aikman called his number in the fourth quarter on a slant that went 80 yards and set up the winning touchdown. God's trying to tell y'all today, you might have dropped a lot of balls. You might have dropped a lot of passes. You might have made a lot of mistakes. But he's willing to throw you another one. You just got to be willing to go get it. When you look at King David, he started out on fire. As a young man, he kills Goliath. He becomes the king, and everything goes his way. He is walking in God's favor until he doesn't. And it causes major destruction throughout his family for three generations. When you look at Judah, he did the complete opposite. He couldn't have started out any worse. Sold his brother to slavery. Had an affair with his daughter-in-law. Weirdo. <laughs> but guys, I realize this might not have been the coolest sermon that you heard today, but I need you to take something home with you, and this is what I need you to take home. It doesn't matter how you start. It's all about how you finish. You can make all the mistakes. Because I know some of you are like, man, I've already screwed up so bad. My kids are so jacked up. You know, my, my wife don't even talk to me. You know, I don't have any friends. I messed up. I made this mistake. I did this a long time ago. It doesn't matter. Today's a new day. Every time you think that you couldn't do any worse, think about Judah. Think about Judah. And he became the tribe that Jesus came from. God can use you regardless of the past that you have. Don't stop building a legacy. Randy Powell left the greatest legacy that you can leave. Because when I think of Randy Powell, I don't even think of Randy Powell. He left a legacy of Jesus Christ. That's our job. It's not about us. It's not about what we accomplish. It's about getting others to know Jesus Christ. When I think of Randy, I think of love. I think of a mentor who let me look like the rock star. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus died on that cross so we could all be rock stars. So regardless, again, guys, regardless of how bad you screwed things up, you ain't Judah. There's still life left. 
catch the pass, go score a touchdown. I had to throw my cowboy in there. You know what I'm saying? I'd do that. Grab a pen and paper. Let's write this down. Go ahead, Nick. A great legacy is not leaving something for people. It's leaving something in people. 